Good morning, and welcome to our worship here at the First Baptist Church of Freehold on this third Sunday of the month of June as we celebrate Father's Day to all the fathers and fatherly figures within and amongst our lives. We are so thankful that you decided to join us braving the intense heat and the heat that is yet to come over the next coming days to bask in the presence of the Lord. To all of our guests and first time worshipers, we grant you with an extra special welcome and we hope and pray that over the next hour, you feel the presence of God in and amongst our worship experience. And to those watching and worshiping with us virtually, we grant you with an extra special welcome as well. And we are so thankful that you decided to join us as part of our Father's Day worship this morning. As we enter into this time of worship, let us hear the choral call to worship. invite you to rise as you are able and join with me in this morning's call to worship. The God of Jacob answers us when we call out to him in times of trouble. He sends us help from the sanctuary and gives us support from Zion. He remembers all of our offerings and delights in the sacrifices set before his throne. He grants us our heart's desires and fulfills all of our plans. We shout for joy over our victory and raise high the banner of the Lord in whom we take pride. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call upon your name. And let us continue by singing our opening hymn, Rejoice ye pure in heart.
let us join together in our unison prayer. God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for fathers young and old. We pray for young fathers newly embracing their vocation. We pray for fathers around the world whose children are lost or suffering. May they know that the God of compassion walks with them in their sorrow. We pray for men who are not fathers by blood, but still mentor and guide us with fatherly love and advice. We pray for those who do not have as strong a relationship with their fathers, that they might find a sense of peace and comfort. We remember those who are no longer with us, but who live forever in our memory and nourish us with their love. As we honor their presence in our lives today, may we heed their lessons. Amen. be seated in the presence of God. Are there any announcements from the congregation this morning? It's uh, Good to welcome back Sue to the choir. She had been away as she battled with COVID and uh, a loss of voice. So we are thankful and I'm sure many in the choir are also thankful of her being able to be a part of the choir and a part of our worship again this morning in song. Are there other announcements this morning? Just a couple of announcements that I have here. Beginning tomorrow, the church office will transition to its summer hour schedule. So the office will be closed on Mondays and resume Tuesday through nine, uh, Tuesday through Friday from nine to 1 p.m. as normal throughout the week. But beginning tomorrow, the office will be closed on Mondays throughout the summer. June special offering is for the one great hour of sharing. You received a letter at the beginning of the month with some more information about what the great hour, one great hour of sharing is. There are special envelopes in the rear of the sanctuary that you can use to give to support uh, American Baptist Home Mission Society, or you can scan the QR code to give through our online giving platform, GiveLify. If you would like to donate flowers to adorn our altar, there is a sign-up sheet in the rear vestibule area. There is an afternoon service this week here at the church at 2 o'clock p.m. On Tuesday, all are invited and welcome to attend and bring a friend to worship. This upcoming Thursday is our next men's breakfast at Gus's Diner at 8.30 a.m. And next Sunday after worship, there will be a trustees meeting. So please be advised to all those and all of the announcements. I invite the children to come forward for the children's moment this morning. Good morning, Oscar. So how many kings or queens do you think you can name off the top of your head? Maybe one? Who comes to mind? 
Queen Elizabeth, that's a very popular one. Many of us are familiar with her work. Um, so can you think of any kings or queens that you might see in comics or on TV? Any pop to mind? Yeah, they're, they're made of ones, some fictional characters that aren't as known or well known to other people. Uh, so today we're talking about kings, and well, monarchs in particular, but his particular king called King David. And he's one of the more famous kings within the Bible. So following the likes of Samuel or Saul, all these other kings that we find within the Bible, or even in the world, we think of kings that are popular, like King Albert is a famous one, or in comics like King Chichala or King Poseidon, all of these different kings. But the one king that we always know and hold in our hearts is King Jesus, who calls us each to serve in the kingdom of God, who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so while Queen Elizabeth may have reigned for a very, very long time, we can be confident that King Jesus reigns in us for all time. And that's something that we can remember. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the royalty of King Jesus. Although the earthly kings know their reigns, we know that your reign lasts from generation to generation. We pray that you continue to rest, rule, abide in our hearts now and forever. Amen. Um, as we enter into a time of prayer, I would like to request prayers on behalf of my student, Sophia Cerullo. Uh, she, we were praying for her back in April. She uh, had had uh, brain surgery when she was down in Florida with her family. Um, she had surgery again this past Tuesday. And um, I saw her yesterday for our um, special voice class, our singing class that we do together. And um, she mentioned to me that she's having another surgery this coming Tuesday and that she's really nervous about it. And we sang this song together. And if you look at your um, additional prayer concerns page, if you turn it over, the words are on there. And the song that we sang is, I know my father loves me. And I know she will be watching the service later from her hospital room. And I wanted to share this song, not only for Sophia, but for all of our children especially who are watching, to remind them that our Almighty Father is always watching them, He's always with them, and He always loves them.
as we come to this time of prayer. Are there prayer concerns from the congregation this morning? Prayer for Judy, for Judy, who was meeting with the surgeon to set up a date for her bypass surgery that's upcoming. We pray that the surgery will go well once the surgery date has been set and that there are no complications. Are there other prayer concerns? Prayers for safe travels in the midst of the stormy seas as grandson and fiance travel to Sardinia to be on a yacht. So we pray for safe travels there and back. Just a couple of prayer concerns that we keep in prayer. Um, continue prayers for Sally, who is here as part of our worship. We're glad to be here back, who had our surgical procedure and is in the midst of her recovery. And continue to pray for Gary's sister-in-law, Ginger, who we lifted up in prayer last week, who was having an upcoming biopsy. Uh, we pray for Sue Beachy's husband, Ray, who was in a car accident this past week and is recovering at home. And continue prayers for Nenny's neighbor, Mary, who is undergoing medical concerns. Let us now enter into a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our almighty Father, creator, sustainer of the universe, we give you thanks and praise for all those who are gathered here as part of this divine encounter with you, an opportunity to fellowship and hear a word from on high. We give you thanks for all those who are gathered here physically and virtually we pray that you bless us, keep us, watch over us until we gather again in the fullness of your love and your grace. Lord, you've heard the prayers of your people this morning, so many prayers of friends, family, loved ones, who are under the watchful eye of medical professionals. We pray for Sally and her continued recovery. We pray for... Subichi's husband, Ray, who is recovering at home from his accident. We pray for Judy's friend as she prepares to set the date for her biopsy procedure. And Gary's sister-in-law, Ginger, whose biopsy is coming up in a few short weeks. We pray that you be with the doctors, the nurses, the medical professionals who are making these difficult decisions. We pray for Sophia continually 
as she prepares for yet another surgery. We pray that you grant them peace, comfort. We pray that you be with them in the stillness of uncertainty. Calm the concern and nerves upon their hearts and in their spirits. We pray that the procedures are successful, that there are no complications, that the recovery might go well and fully. We know that you are a God who heals, and so we pray your healing touch to reach down into creation. We pray for those that are in the midst of travels, in the midst of the summer season, for travels near and far, domestic and international, for those along the highways, the byways, the skyways, we pray for safe traveling mercies that there might be no hurt, harm, or danger to befell any of us or our loved ones. We pray that home might be as it was left when we return. We pray that our travels be safe from natural disasters and the storms that have elevated and escalated over the past weeks. A world that is full of storms and warm, a world that is yet warming. We pray for your covering, we pray for your safety. We pray for a world that is impacted by war, by violence, by hate, by evil. We pray for your peace to rain down so that creation and all creation might be at peace. That the weapons of war turned into plowshares for peace that love saturate our hearts and the nations, so that there might be war no more. Oh God, there's so much as we look out upon our world that is happening that makes our hearts ache. We pray that you stand in the midst and stand in the gap, so that thy will in thy creation might indeed be done now and always. O oh God, you have heard the words spoken from our lips, but you hear it from the depths of our hearts. We pray according to your will. May the petitions of our heart be done. We pray all this in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, who taught his disciples this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to this time of giving, we are reminded that God loves a cheerful giver, and that it is truly indeed blessed to give than it is to receive. For those of you watching and worshiping with us virtually, you can scan the QR code that has appeared on your screen to give your donation and your gift online to our Givelify platform. And for those that are gathered here in the sanctuary, you too can either scan the QR code or place your gift in the collection basket as it comes around. We're a reminder we are also collecting throughout the month of June for the one great hour of sharing mission. And so as the ushers give, or prepare to come forward, may we cheerfully give for all that God has given us.
Let us pray. O oh God, for all that you have given us, we take this time to give you back a portion of that which is already yours. Use these gifts to build up your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. As we continue along in our worship, let us sing together, This is my Father's world. As we prepare our hearts to hear a word from the Lord, let us hear the words of Scripture from the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king amongst his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely his anointed is now before the Lord. 
But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, unfortunately, happens to be our choir's last Sunday for this church year. So I hope you will indulge me as I share a few words of gratitude and thanks to all of the people seated behind me and some who are not with us this morning. This year has been full of many joys. We have welcomed three new members to our choir. So we thank Nancy Ann Eby, who is on vacation this week, but we are very grateful to have her as part of our choir. Our wonderful music ministry intern, Jasmine Viatoro, joined us this year. And of course, our wonderful Pastor David, who comes up and sings with us every Sunday (laughs) despite sometimes his reluctance to do so. (laughs) It's also been a year of loss, and we are so grateful to our wonderful dear friend, Terry Vanacek, who was such a treasured part of our choir in years past. So I would just like to ask if you all would join me in thanking our wonderful choir members who every Sunday at 915 every Thursday at 4.30, are here preparing music to share to the glory of God. And only some of those times, really a fraction of those times, involve any pizza. So they do it not for the accolades, not for the food, but to enhance our worship service to the glory of God. Thank you.
As we come to this time of hearing the preached word, let us pray. O oh God, we pray that you give us eyes to see anew, ears to hear afresh, a heart to be warmed and a spirit to be transformed, so that we might not leave this place ever the same. Amen. What does royalty look like? This is the question I posed to myself as I stared at my computer screen this past Monday, trying to figure out how I want to start this sermon. Does a royal figure have a certain style or appearance to them? Does a king or queen have to meet certain physical qualifications before they assume the crown? Monarchs around the world come in all shapes, all sizes, all ages, but on the whole are usually the oldest of their siblings. And depending on how long one's parents are in charge, it might take them a while to assume their royal garments. They are often described in the most grandiose of terms and descriptions, making them larger than life, certainly separated from the commoners, their constituents. But these descriptions are almost always focused on the outward appearance, something that even the greatest and wisest people fall victim to every once in a while. As we enter into our text, we recall that last week the elders did not want a God-centered person to rule over them. So they chose Saul, and chapters 8 through 15 indicate that that was not the best decision, one could say. So Samuel, now is the time to appoint a new king. God tells them that the people have had their choice, they have spoken, they have seen the error of their ways, and now is time for them to have a new king in charge. For I have rejected Saul from being king over them. So fill your horn with anointing oil, make your way to Bethlehem, and there you will find Jesse. And amongst his sons you will find the king that I have chosen. Now this, of course, worried Samuel as we hear in the second verse. How can I go and appoint a new king? This current king will kill me. Do you not know that? And rightfully so. No one wants to be ousted from power. No one wants their heir apparent just waiting in the wings, watching, waiting for their turn. And Samuel has been under constant surveillance by Saul. So his fear is legitimate. But God, as always, has a plan in case to cover every single possible scenario that might take place. Go and take a heifer with you, Samuel. And when you get to the city, say that you have come to sacrifice to the Lord. That is one of your priestly responsibilities. So under this covert operation of sacrifice, I will show you what you are to do next. So Samuel listens and he goes to Bethlehem. Now when a prophet comes to your town, you know that you have done something very egregious and God is ready to tell you what you did and why God is displeased at your actions. 
Everyone knows who Samuel is and the power behind his prophetic voice. But they also know that Samuel and Saul are not on the best of speaking terms. So at the same time as they see Samuel approach, they are afraid that they too might become targets of the king's rage. So the people of Bethlehem have approached Samuel, deathly afraid of why he is here. Do you come in peace? As they utter through trembling breath, yes, I come in peace. A collective sigh of relief for the city of Bethlehem comes out of the elders' lips. I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Samuel says, consecrate yourselves. Prepare yourselves for the sacrifice. And so as they leave, he goes to Jesse's house and he himself consecrates Jesse and his sons, inviting them to as special guests for this ritualistic meal. It's beginning in the fifth verse that Jesse begins to present his sons before Samuel and before God. Only one of the sons will be anointed as God's chosen heir to Saul's throne. Eliab, Jesse's oldest son, the first to be presented. He is described as an imposing figure, the looks on the outside of a traditional king, broad shoulders, tall in height. In many respects, he was externally a spitting image to Saul. He was what the people would choose as a king. And so Samuel thought to himself, well, that was a short trip. Surely this is the chosen one. But God heard Samuel's thought and responded in his ear, Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his stature, because I have rejected that qualification for kingship. You do not see what I see. You focus on how someone looks, but I can see on the inside and see how someone lives. Samuel thinks about these words as Jesse's second oldest, Abinadab, is next to be presented. As he stands before Samuel, he too is not God's chosen one. And the same process happens for Shema and his four brothers, all of whom the same response echoes from Samuel's lips. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Seven sons have passed by Samuel. The number of completion within the Hebrew Bible, God telling Samuel that the ways of choosing a king before are now over. This is a new start, a fresh beginning for the people and for the kingdom himself. And who should mark this beginning? In the 11th verse, Samuel asked Jesse if these are all of his sons. God wouldn't have sent him here for failure, not finding one to anoint. Quoting the wise Yoda, Jesse says, there is another. My youngest son, but he is out in the fields. Maybe a bit of short shadowing or maybe just biblical poetic coincidence. The shepherd that we all now sit and wait to arrive. We don't even get to know his name until after his anointing. All we know as he approaches the feast from the fields is of his appearance. His reddish complexion, his beautiful highs, his handsomeness. I guess it doesn't seem to hurt after all. And God does allow our natural selves to come to the forefront in all ways. 
Certainly David was the last choice, so much so his father didn't even think he was up for the task. But God has looked upon his heart and approved. And before Samuel could even utter a word, God speaks, arise and anoint him. Here is your king. The spirit of the Lord fills David as the oil from the horn is smeared upon his head. In the presence of his father, his brothers, the elders that have come for the sacrifice, David has been chosen to be the God-centered leader of the nation. And now that his task has been completed, Samuel leaves Bethlehem to return to his home. For the story now shifts to the new king. As I shared last week, the people that we often want as kings are not the same people that God has called. God doesn't care about those that look a certain way, but those who live a certain way. That is the story of God. Choosing those that are the last person that anyone would consider or think of. God's chosen ones being the ones that we overlooked even while they were in our proximity. So here we find our new king, a man after God's own heart, chosen by God because he was thought of as not qualified even by his own blood. A king that woke up with a list of chores to do and went to bed with an entire kingdom waiting for his hands. Of course, as we will explore over the next month, we will see what happens when this king sees himself and not God as the center of this kingdom. But for now, we know that God is on the move. God has consecrated young David for such a time as this. So you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with me? I am not reddish in color, or at least not yet. Check back after this past week and the week to come. Some have beautiful eyes, yes, but that is besides the point, we haven't been keeping sheep, but all of us have been doing some kind of work leading up to this moment. All of us have been called from the fields, anointed and consecrated by God, called to particular avenues precisely because nobody other than God thought we were fit for the task. All of us have the Spirit of God moving in and through us, working in ways that only God knows and God sees. All of us have been called to embody God's heart in God's world as we place God in the center of our lives. So what have we been called to do? Perhaps, as we will see next week, it's to knock down some giants who stand in God's way. Perhaps it is to call systems and structures to task, proclaiming the ushering in of God's kingdom. Perhaps it is to be a prophetic presence and call the people out for their sinful natures. I do not know what God has placed upon your heart, But what I do know is that the oil of anointing is still fresh, still resting upon your heads. So friends, arise. You have been anointed by God for such a time as this. May we leave this place going forth in our consecration and our calling. For the world awaits you and what you have been called to do. Amen.
May you rise as you are able and let us join together in singing our closing hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. We give you thanks for joining us here as part of our worship on this Father's Day to which we extend to all the fathers and fatherly figures worshiping with us physically and virtually. Just a reminder of our afternoon worship service this upcoming Tuesday. And join, we are excited and join us back here next Sunday as we again gather to hear a word from the Lord and proclaim the songs of faith. May you hear these words from benediction before our choir sends us forward. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in you now and forever, God's beloved. Amen.